Hey everyone, it's Maureen. Today I wanted to show you some hairstyles and various different hats from the Tudor time frame. And the hair is kind of long today because I am going to braid it and show you how I do it. But forewarning, the way that I style my hair would not be historically accurate. Um, most of the time when I am trying to get to an, a Society for Creative Anachronism event, what ends up happening is I have to do my hair the morning of. I don't take the time to do what they call hair taping, which means I would have about a three yard piece of linen tape that I would braid into the one side of my hair braid it into the other side of, of my hair, and then take a, a bodkin or a yarn needle and then basically take the extra lengths and sew it through the rest of my hair to hold it in place all day. There are other videos on YouTube about this process, which I will link in the description below. Morgan Donner's hair taping video is by far the best. I'm not going to go, go over the same information that she has already so generously provided for us and anyone in the uh, costume community or interested in historical hairstyles to take advantage of. I have a Jace off camera who is sniffing and wanting to crawl all over everything. So what I'm using is a wide tooth rat tail comb couple of hair elastics that match the color of my hair and also a handful of bobby pins. I want to show you that this can be done quickly if need be. If you want to take the more historically accurate way, hair taping is the way to go. But this is what we'll do for today. So I have my hair divided down the middle. I combed it out already to get rid of most of the snarls. But I use a big wide tooth rat tail comb to get through the bigger snarls that unfortunately happen. And also my hair is naturally curly. It looks extra fluffy today because unfortunately when you comb out curly hair, it gets fluffy. So I divide it into three sections and do a traditional rope braid. Try to make them as even as possible. And I start this process just behind the ear and try to make your tension really tight when you start. Otherwise, you'll have this bulge of hair sitting behind your ear. Now my hair has gotten particularly long during our wondrous pandemic. And this is, to be honest with you, the longest my hair has ever been in my lifetime. My mother used to cut it really short. To, but to be honest, that was partially my fault because I was a tomboy, believe it or not, and I would not take care of my hair. So I ran around with short hairstyles for most of my childhood and I started growing out my hair in high school because with the curl, if I kept it short, it would just turn into really tiny, very small ringlets. It would be very puffy. And what ends up happening, I'll take your hair tie and finish off the end. It doesn't matter if you have a little, little bit on the end as much because you're gonna be tucking it in and using the bobby pins to hide it anyway. And your hair is going under a hat. So keep that in mind. So there's one. But as I was saying, I started growing it out in high school. For like my senior pictures, I had like a bob. And uh, because my hair is curly, it takes a long time for length to actually happen. This, my hair here I've not washed it in probably about a month. I know, I know, there's some people like, ew. I don't wash my hair regularly because it's very dry. With curly hair, the oils in your scalp don't necessarily go down the shafts of your hair, your, the strands of your hair, very easily. 
So the less that I wash it, the more the natural oils can seep down my hair um, follicles. Regular combing helps in this process. Dry shampoo is sort of the modern version of what they used in the 18th century for their hair products that made their hair kind of look whitish grayish color. Um, but you can use dry shampoo to uh, achieve the same situation. Now you notice this is a little looser than this one. So I'm actually gonna redo it. That's what happens when you get talking. Let's try this again. Since my last video, I have had over 20 subscribers join our channel. Welcome to the channel. I don't do hairstyling videos on a regular basis. I am just kind of showing you what I know and what has worked for me. Other people have other ways and other methods that work for them. The best option when it comes to historical hairstyles and wearing hats and such is try trial and error, basically. All right, so I'm pretty much down to the bottom here. I'm gonna use my hair elastic to secure the bottom of my hair. I've heard that the oils of your hair are called sebum, which is sort of a, a combination, I think, also of the um, scalp, scalp oils in general that are, are created. All right, so this is at the end of an event. Sometimes I'll just take my hair down and this is, this is how it'll look. Um, what I'm doing is taking this braid and I'm kind of crisscrossing them and bringing this one over the top of the crown of my head. So if you think about it, I'm kind of doing hair taping without the tapes. This is what the modern version would sort of look like. So I'm taking a hair pin um, and then basically opening it up slightly and taking some of the hair at the base and a bit into the braid and just securing it. You want to make sure that you're getting a little bit of the hair, this hair, to help hold it into place. Now, what I'm gonna do is since I have this braid that's on the top of my head is sort of gone behind, crisscrossed and over the top, my hair is long enough to do this. There's a small gap between my scalp and the braid and I'm going to pull this other braid up underneath it. And then what I do is I tuck the ends underneath the braid before bringing it, it across. And then just secure this basically in four locations. And I'm gonna try to tuck the hair elastic under this braid with the tail and such. Sometimes they like to stick out. There you go. Where it feels loose, put another bobby pin. I use about anywhere from four to six for the length of my hair. Okay. So, this is sort of in a crown braid on the back of my head. I can crisscross the braids in the back because my hair is so long. If my hair didn't come down to here, I wouldn't necessarily have to crisscross it, but it uses up and creates a nice bump at the bottom of the nape of my neck. So this hairstyle I like to use for most Tudor hairstyles because you have the 
middle part in the front. You're going to see this a lot in um, Tudor hairstyles. So the first hat I'm going to show you is what is known as a French hood. Now, this is a French hood that was made as all one piece with an attached veil. This is before the more recent update about them being separate pieces. And many people enjoyed using the, the single piece for convenience, but I would not say it's an accurate French hood, but this will give us the idea of the style. Specifically, this one is made by Tudor Dreams historical costumer, Gina Clark, and she makes beautiful stuff. I have to say. It's not a sponsored video, but nonetheless. So, all right. So I have this ruffle in the front. This looks like it's made of silk. And there is a round portion that goes at the base of the head. I'm going to try to tuck my braid just ahead of there's a, a little back piece in the back of this hat there isn't really any wire so to speak but there we go we have the veil which is made of velvet ah there we go the edges of the bilament were sitting so for this one you have ruffles in the front here. Um, in the newer research, they say that there's an under cap, a secondary cap, which is normally red, and then the veil, which would normally create this crescent shape. And then the beaded part is called a bilament, which this one is probably a, a 1540s one, since it comes down a little lower. This one covers my ears almost perfectly. It's actually a very good fit. But because this, this under cap comes around and joins underneath at the very nape of my neck, I can take the back of the, the crown braid that we created and just push that hair up into the inside of the French hood, just slightly. It creates friction and holds this in place without any pins. Although I, I really do support the new research that's been shown on the French hoods, showing that you have yourself a coif-like layer, a middle cap that's normally made of silk and has um, the, I think they call it a crispin, which ends up being the um, ruffled metallic feature. And then you could customize the, the hood, the veil, with uh, bilament decoration. Uh, or there were some, depending on your class, that weren't as decorated. The French hood would have been worn in the Tudor time frame from about 1520 to about 1550. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth at the time would have been Princess Elizabeth is seen wearing one of these in her portrait from when she was the age of 13. So these styles of, of hoods were worn for a particularly long period of time and slowly went out of fashion. I mean, it took a long time for these to, to go out of fashion. But this one sits high up off the head and it, it looks very close to what we would think of as a French hood, so to speak. But it looks like that on the new research, this was not nearly as high as one would think. And I could even push this back a little further to expose more hair, which was of course very popular. I've made a few French hoods in this similar way and they're, I have to say they are very secure as one piece. But to be honest with you, even with the separate pieces, I bet that they could be easily just as secure with pins because I've been able to dress myself in dresses with pins and 
they're secure all day. So this is sort of your, your early version. Besides the French hood, simultaneously you also have, um, it is currently called the gabled headdress or the English hood, which is normally more geometric. It would create and frame the face. And that particular one, I would say, you see that more around 1500. If you look at images of Elizabeth of York, she particularly wore quite a lot of the gabled styled headdress. We call that now, but in period it would have been known as the English hood or English, well, in English hood in that case. The terminology is always tricky because it could be spelled a couple different ways because English was not standardized in its spelling for a long time. And um, it's the same situation with the layers of the French hood. All those layers didn't necessarily have a standardized spelling as, as easily. Like Billament is spelled like two or three different ways. So when one is researching, it gets a bit complicated at times. But this is probably one of the earlier ones that, that I happened to just grab for this particular video. Um, although, take a look at the English headdress, it's, or English hood. It is, it's an interesting fashion choice. It's something that not, I will say this, not all ladies can pull this off. I think the French hood was a bit more popular because it was able to work with many different face shapes. So I'm going to pull this off. So my hair or braid has probably moved around just a little bit. But if it was taped, it wouldn't have moved very much. But there is this portion of the hood that the back of my braid was hold, holding this hat into place. Just to show you what that looked like. But yes, this would be a prior style of hat from the 1520s to the 1540s. So let's see here. I'm going to go over coifs in quite a few different ways. This is the one that you'll see me in the most common. This is a linen coif. Still got a knot in it. It's a loosely woven linen coif. I went ahead and put stitches at the top, kind of like a hybrid Brigida cap, so to speak, that may have possibly come from the prior hat, because Brigida caps were known and worn before the coifs were. Okay, so there's a channel for a drawstring at the very base of the coif. And here's my drawstring, so I just pull it tight. Tie it on top. Give yourself plenty of ties. There's nothing wrong with tying it a few times if that's what it takes for it to be secure on your head all day. Okay, so this is my standard hood. Yet again, you could wear your hair in a crown braid like it is currently here. Uh, there's a lot of extra room here where you could wear just a high bun with a center part. That would work too for this. But it covers my ears and it is secure. It is not going anywhere. <laughs> and for the most part, because of the way that this is designed, um, with my curly hair, if it's humid, I'll get wispies going on. This keeps the wispies under control as well because there are some short hairs that are just gonna try to work their way out. This also, because of it may, being made of linen, it slightly stretches a little bit when you tie it snug. So, now if it's feeling a little too tight around the ears, I pull at the crown a little bit to release some of the fabric there too. So. 
with the ties that go up over the head, it also can help move your hair back to create and fill out the rest of the coif. If I don't have enough to fill it, sometimes what I'll do is I'll pin it on the top of the head like that. And it'll just have this nice little gather pinned the right to the top of the head. You'll want a longer straight pin for that kind of situation. Something almost bordering a corsage pin or a um, maybe not quite a hat pin, but something a bit longer because I have a lot of material there that would have to be, be secured to place. But this is what a standard coif would look like. And these were normally worn, the shape varied a little bit, but these would have been worn by the, the middle and lower class exclusively. This shape you see specifically around the uh, 1550s, 1570s, where you'll get a little kind of point going on. And they can be decorated a couple different ways. This is what they call black work embroidery. So this one was made for me. This is not one that I made, but I put a little bit of gold lace on the front to be fancy. I, this under one is so secure, I can wear this one as an over. Look at that. I'm extra fancy, I'm wearing two. Hold on there, there we go. All that. Now, embroidery costs money. So keep in mind that with something like this, you would probably be doing at least mid or, middle to upper middle class, even low noble with something that's embroidered, especially as much as this. There's that. Yet again, with the embroidered ones, you're seeing these late uh, into the like 1550s, 1570s, 1580s. You're seeing a lot of embroidered caps and ones like this where a lot of the surface is covered by the embroidery. All of this is actually done in like a split stitch. So we're not talking extra fancy embroidery stitches here. This is just following the pattern and creating the embroidery out of split stitch. There's no other stitches on this particular cap. Let's see. I have another one here. This is also black worked, but it is in a bit more of a, a smaller pattern instead of it being so big. Now I have the back of this already pinned in place, so I'm going to leave that be but I actually got this pattern for this coif off a spoon flower. There is a black work coif, a black work coif pattern on spoon flower that I had printed out on cotton and I embroidered this with uh, silk in that case and edged it with lucid cord. So it is, and lined in linen, of course. And I use the same black and white uh, cotton edging for my drawstring too. Let's see, very similar to the one I'm wearing. The drawstring case is at the bottom of the coif. So if you open this up fully and you didn't have this the seam in the middle sewn, it looks like a bell shape, which is interesting. It shows you sort of how one shape ends up equating another and fitting one's noggin. Bear with me while I tackle some tangles. I don't want this to turn into a, a knot. One is, this one has a lot of drawstring on it, which is why we're dealing with the tangles. So it's good to have a decent amount of drawstring, but you don't want to go overboard or you're going to be doing this a lot. 
I have like three or four four other hats to go through, so we've got quite quite a bit yet to go. Okay, there's just one knot here. It's just all sorts of wrapped around one another. Okay, there we go. We got it. All right. So linen lined, cotton outside, silk on cotton. So we'll put this one up over top because yet again, this one is on pretty good. So this one is bigger than the other one as well. So when I tie these, I do very similar with the hair. I kind of crisscross it in the back to draw string. The drawstring case in the back turns into a little loop, a little hole. So once you have that in the back, you're doing the same thing. You're going to tie it up over the top. Now I added little tassels to this, but you don't have to necessarily do that. Okay. Now there's enough here. That I can tie it up over top, I think, twice here. Now, I'm not going to tie it fully. I'm just going to tuck the tassels in. But because I have that sort of pinned at the top, you get a nice fullness, though. See how it forms this nice shape? I'll show you what the back looks like on this one. So you have this fullness here, and you'll have some fullness at the bottom too. When it's gathered in real snug, it'll be this tiny little hole. You'll have a certain amount of bulk because of the drawstring case. But basically, you could run around, it's not moving. This would be the same time frame as the other. So you're dealing with the uh, late 1500s. These probably could almost go to the end, end of the period with either black work or the next one I'm going to show you is what they call polychrome. What that means is that it's multiple colors and sometimes metal on there too. So you might have metallics on it as well. This would be the very end of the period, would be a polychromed coif, like this one. So we have several different flowers on here. We've got a carnation, a rose, a pomegranate, it's like a forget-me-not, strawberries, some other grapes, some other strawberries, another rose, a different pomegranate, several different flowers. This is made of cotton. This was a particular gift from a friend. But we have a different kind of drawstring here. On this one, um, you have the drawstring yet again at the bottom, but this one happens to have a bigger tape on it. Now keep in mind, I'm taking these on and off. During the day when you have your coif on, it's on. You're not gonna end up really taking it off. I just put a little bow at the bottom, just like when you tie your shoe kind of thing. Now the one drawstring's a little longer than the other, so I'll have to even these out the next time. Now this one's shaped in such a way that you're noticing that it really creates quite the little heart shape. I have a drawstring before my ear here. There we go. But you're getting that heart-shaped shape again. With the hair, 
uh, past 1550, you start to see rolls appear in the front. Instead of it just showing your hair flat, women would curl their hair um, or frizz it out in the front, push these coifs back, and then you would have this heart-shaped hairstyle along with wearing your coif, which was quite popular. Um, this one has, you know, yet again, a bit of fullness to it. Uh, polychromes really would have been at the very late time frame. Um, would have been worn by somebody who would be more of the wealthy class because that's the few people who would have been able to afford this kind of embroidery. Would have been someone of, of nobility more than likely. But uh, an impressive show of, of wealth, though you have to say it's very beautiful. Someone of, of a lesser class just would have either had it plain, there's plenty of plain ones, uh, or they would have had a very little embroidery because the, the more it's embroidered, the more money it's worth. There we go. Evened it out. Polychrome embroidered coif. And this is one that's been a little controversial, so to speak. You'll hear it called a French adifé. It seems to be about the same time that you run into the coifs themselves. This one happens to be made out of cotton has a wire in the edge. You have this to cover your hair in the back. But it creates a heart shape, which also helped accommodate the heart-shaped hairstyle of, of the age. I believe it was thought that this was more of a hairstyle for the ladies in France And this one happens to have, of course, a little bit of pearls on it. I don't know if we can put it <clears throat> put it over everything. Not with the coif on, it looks like. All right, let's try this. So as you can see, it's starting to pull pull out a little bit with that. That I would suspect because I've just put on however many coifs. Don't have any other bobby pins. We'll see if we can get this one in. We may may or may not be successful. We shall see. This one would probably be more successful with a bun in the back, but we'll try. Oh, there we go. You can kind of get an idea of the shape. Let's try to form the wire to the right shape here. Sort of the French attaché. Now, keep in mind, you would do the hair rolls on this, and because your hat accommodates for them, you could really go to town. Now, there has been some questions on this particular style as to whether or not it it is accurate, but we do have some paintings depicting a very similar hat to this. So... wire slipped out of where it was supposed to be but 
nonetheless. The Mickey Mouse ears of the 16th century, so to speak. So the French attaché. I mean, you could certainly have gold all along here. You could have gold along back here. You could really have this decorated up to, depending on your, your social class and such as well. So my braid was holding that in, into place. And then the, my bottom braid, yet again, was sitting on the inside of the band. So this hairstyle is pretty, pretty versatile, I have to say. Uh, now, there are hair nets that you see that are beaded in some portraits. Now, I'm not going to pull my hair along just to put it in, in this. But I wanted to show you this hat. Ooh. It's somewhat similar to the Atefe style, but you could put your hair rolls, of course, right up in front and then it accommodates for it right there. And then you could have your hair loose and put into the back, or you could stuff this with artificial hair. Hair pieces were very common during the 16th century. So don't shy away from using artificial hair if you don't have enough for yourself. one on. Besides coifs, and there was a lot of different coifs, there would also be straw hats that one could wear over your coif is one thing that people did. I'm going to put this one on to show you the next hat because these kind of go together. See, this one is a bit big on me, so if I'm not wearing a coif underneath it. Let's see here. Then I just have to use my own head and hair to fill it out. So keep in mind that these, with the appropriate hairstyles, are going to look a bit more filled out. Um, the crown braid is one that I use fairly often other than a high bun. Uh, high buns work great also, as I had mentioned in the coifs. This is a Tudor flat cap. It's made of wool, lined in linen, embroidered all over the place. This was actually a, a gift. Also, I have, I have fantastic friends, gosh. I mean, I can't believe she embroidered in here because you're not gonna necessarily see the embroidery, but it is awesome. But um, we have embroidery basically from uh, Margaret Tudor, I believe, um, Charles Brandon's wife. Um, there was embroidery on her smock, the, uh, replicated those flowers there. There's also some braiding from the Book of Kells and some other pieces also that are from the Book of Kells. So a combination of Tudor and, and Irish because my SCA persona is a Irish woman living in Tudor, England. So um, the person who researched this project wanted to do little roses and the Celtic knots, which is just awesome. Somebody took a lot of time and love on this and I'm greatly appreciative. Basically, one would wear this flat cap over top your coif. I was trying to not pull wespies here, 
but it basically, you could pin it into place if you really needed to. But what I would wear this with would be a uh, English fitted gown. My plans are to make an English fitted gown out of black wool, following the same floral embroidery on it because must have a matching outfit with the hat. I don't have to, but why wouldn't you? And if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much for taking the time to watch nearly all the way through at this point. But yeah, this is a Tudor flat cap. You would wear this over your coif and you'd wear this for special occasions more, more so than anything else. They could be plain, they can be decorated. I mean, come on, extra fancy. Fancy, fancy. This is just cool. I've actually, this is the first time I've actually got to try it on and look at it in the mirror with a coif, so. And it fits my head pretty well. I, I mean, these aren't gonna have to fit over your head snugly. It's really just sort of sitting there, almost like if you think of a, of a beret, so to speak, this is somewhat similar to that kind of fit where it's on there mostly. I mean, if, if I did some running, it would probably fall off, but where am I going in a hurry? But yeah, that's what the top looks like. Back. Okay. So, this I would say with the Tudor flat cap, yet again, you're dealing sort of very similar mid 1550s at the earliest, all, all the way up through through the end of the period. Middling, uh, middle class clothes did not change nearly as fast as the fashions of the, the Tudor court. Um, I don't think you'd be seeing Tudor flat caps on ladies past Catherine Parr too, too far, because um, she was, was known to have one of these wonderful hats too. But um, into the Elizabethan age, I don't think you'd see the flat caps uh, worn except for probably middle middle or lower classes because as, as I mentioned, the fashions just change slower. But that is just a cool hat. <laughs> just doesn't go with the shirt though, you know? But anyway, this was a sort of brief look at the different styles of coifs, how they could be decorated also, um, the different styles of hats, sort of going from about 1520 all the way to about 1570 or so is, is what I'm looking at. Maybe 1580 with the atefe. Questionable there, though. If you have any particular questions on the styles of hats, I can go into more detail with it. You can email me through the discussions section of my channel. My email is there. You can also leave a comment as well on this video. And this is one of my, my longer ones. So yes, if you've made it this far, you're awesome. If you're wanting to um, watch other videos, I'm gonna be putting more out in the Tudor clo women's clothing series is my goal for the next few months to get them done in a couple uh, doll videos if possible. We'll see. Just trying to think. I've got a sleeping cat over here. He's very cute and distracting. Let me, let me just put you right here. All the hats. And there's a sleeping Jace. It's kind of hard to see up against my other pile of, of clothing there, but He's sleeping. That's his backside, unfortunately. We don't really get to see the front of him through here. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking. It's always good for the al algorithm. And subscribing if you haven't already. I upload every other week. 
and I try to do that about midday on, on those Fridays that I upload them, every other Friday. And I really appreciate all of my new subscribers that have come on board. Get ready, folks. We're going to have some fun. Bye.